Hello and welcome to part 2 of this laminate and furniture linoleum video series. In this part I will make a full detailed build of this tabletop. It's for a bathroom cabinet that I'm working on at the moment. I described the steps briefly in part 1, how to achieve this look with edge profiles and rounded corners. But here I will make a full detailed build and give you more information about each step. This will be divided into two parts, part 2a and 2b, because it became a bit too long otherwise. Here in part 2a I will focus on the edge banding, how to determine the thickness and how to cut them and how to glue them on and how to trim them flush with the base material. I will take this step by step and I will show you all the details. Step number one is quite simple and it is to determine how thick edge bandings that you need. And for this you need a circle template or a divider. But you could also do this in a CAD program in the computer. There are two main things driving the required edge banding thickness. Number one is the radius on the corner and number two is the profile of the edge. Both of these will consume some of your edge banding. For this product I will have a 10mm outer radius and then the edge profile will eat up another 3mm and that leaves me at this line here. Then I drew two lines of an intended edge banding thickness of 8 millimeters, and that gives me some margin to this inner line here. So 8 millimeter would be good enough and stay on the safe side, but I will go for a slightly thicker edge banding of 10 millimeters. It will make it easier to keep track of the numbers, and also a thicker edge banding is easier to work with since it's not as flimsy as the thinner one. With the edge banding thickness decided, it's time to cut the actual parts for this. And for that I have these two pieces of oak, these are from the same long plank and I like to keep it that way for one project because then I know that will color match quite good all the edge bandings for my project. These two are for my entire project even if I only will show you how I build the top. These are planed slightly oversized in thickness, these are 18 mm and the base is 16 so I have 2 mm extra thickness to play with. And that is to have some margin for sliding in the glue up when I glue this to the base material. These pieces are also slightly oversized in length and that's always a good thing to have. You never know if you encounter a snipe problem or any other things when you later plane the edge bandings to correct thickness. So here is the workflow. The outer edges of my two boards are jointed and flat and perpendicular to these faces here. I then go to the bandsaw and cut one edge banding from each side of my jointed and plain boards. Then I head back to the jointer and rejoint these edges. I repeat this process over and over again until I have enough edge bandings for my product plus a few extra ones. Don't worry if the parts are slightly warped at this stage, it won't be a problem later on when you glue this onto the base. Since I rejointed the edge of my boards between each rip on the bandsaw, one side on all my parts will have a planed surface and the other one will have a bandsawn surface and they will all be about 11 mm thick. So now I will send them through the planer to get them to correct thickness 10 mm and to get the planed surface on both sides. Instead of this advanced or joint or planar method that I showed, some people use the table saw instead for this operation to make their edge bandings and in that case they use a fin rip guide or a fin rip jig. But this method that I showed here is the one that I prefer. All my edge bandings plus a few extra are plain to the same thickness, 10 millimeters. Then I have a few special ones that are 15 millimeter, but more about those later. If I was only making a tabletop here today and only had four edge bandings to keep track of, it could be that I would have numbered them and then in the glue up I would keep track of what's up and down and in and out and trying to grain match the corners and so on. But this is a much bigger project than that and it would be too much work for me to keep track of all my edge bandings. Also they come from the same piece of wood and they would color match very well even if they're not grain matched. And to add to that discussion, Using butt joint corners as I do here today, you won't get that perfect grain match in the corners anyway. After that small detour, let's get back on track. All the edge bandings are done and it's time to cut the base material to size. To cut the base material to size, there are at least two major ways how to do that. 
In the first method you aim for the correct dimensions at this stage before the edge bandings are glued on and the second option is to have the parts slightly oversized and then you trim them to size with the edge bandings glued on. I will show method 1 here in detail, I aim for the final dimensions at this stage and then later on I will give some tips if you want to use method 2 instead. So we aim for an edge banding thickness of 10 mm but it doesn't really matter if we ended up slightly thin or thick. What you do to cut to correct dimensions at this stage is that you slide two pieces of your edge banding against one edge of your workpiece and then you lay out your overall dimension on the other side and that goes for both this direction and this direction. I then head over to my table saw to cut my base material to correct dimensions. Before I cut my edge bandings to length I actually cut off about 5 cm from each part and that is to get rid of this area out here. You see a small color difference from here to here and that's a small snipe and that part I don't want to use. So I cut these ends off all my edge banding parts and then I cut my edge bandings to correct dimensions plus a little bit more. Time to glue on our edge bandings and I will start with the two sides that will be least visible on our final part and I will show you the reason to that. On a piece like this that we build here today, I will have one side that is more visible than the other ones and this is indicated with this eye. This is my front surface of my final piece. By edge banding the least visible sides first, the short sides, I move the joint between the edge banding to the sides. And looking at the front, this is free from joints. Time to glue the first edge banding and I apply some glue with a brush, spread it out. And then if I have a preferred outside of my edge banding, I indicate that with an arrow. Then I just press this on and slide it around a bit. And as you can see, the edge banding is cut slightly oversized in length and that's intentional that will be trimmed away later. And then as I have the part in this state, I secure the edge banding with a few pieces of tape. This is to prevent it from sliding around until I put it in the clamps. The tape also does a pretty good job of centering the edge banding in the thickness direction. Then I bring my piece over to the clamps and just lay it down here. Then I start tightening the clamps and what you should check here is that you have some protruding edge banding on both the front side and the back side. So as mentioned the tape should hold it quite well in that position so it, it's usually no problem. And while the glue dries I would like to mention possible ways how to clamp the edge bandings to your workpiece. The one I showed here today is my preferred solution if the workpiece is small enough to handle it and if my clamps are long enough to reach. Sometimes if you have really big workpieces that is not the case then you can use these Bessy edge clamps that clamp the edge banding directly to the workpiece. The drawback with these type of clamps is that they are quite expensive and you need quite a few of them especially for longer edge bandings. There are some cheaper types of edge clamps as well, like these ones here for instance, it's a rubber edge clamp, but I haven't tested these ones myself. And then I know some people rely on tape only to hold the edge bandings clamped to the workpiece. I use that myself for some smaller projects and it works okay, but you don't get any real pressure between the parts. When the glue has dried, the next step is to trim the edge bandings so they become flush with the base material on both sides. I have three different methods how to do this. If I'm only making a few pieces, like this one, and the grain is nice, it could be that I trim my edge bandings with hand plane and then I start with a larger plane with a coarser setting. And then as I get closer I switch to a small block plane with a finer setting to trim the surfaces flush with each other. This hand plane method is actually really quick and if I only have one or two parts to make and they are not too big and the grain is nice and doesn't cause me any trouble, that's the method that I use. But if I have more to make or if I have trouble some grain, I switch to the router table instead. In the router table I install a bearing guided bit and I set it at the height so it will trim the edge banding plus a little bit more so it takes the glue squeeze out as well. Then I have this curtain style router table fence that can move up and down. So I move that up so the bit just passes it and don't touch the fence. 
Then I use a flat test piece to set the fan so the test piece just touched the bearing. Here I'm routing in the wrong direction, a so called climb cut, and that is to avoid tear out and get a better finish. This climb cutting technique that I used here, it could be quite dangerous if you're not prepared that the workpiece wants to pull away from you or if you take too much in one go. But I used this many times and I'm prepared for it and I only use it when I route away very small sections of wood. Using the router table this way to trim the edge bandings is my preferred solution. It's quick to set up, it's really quick to run the parts and it gives consistent results. But sometimes the parts are just too big to handle on the router table so then I have a third method for trimming the edge bandings and this one includes a handheld router instead. If you do a search on edge banding trimming you will find many variations on this, mine is not special in any way. On this side we have a big plate onto which the router is mounted. Looking at the back side of the jig you can see a step here that's about 3 millimeters, and that's the most protruding edge bandings that I can route away using this jig. On the side I use the router's original fans and that's just to control so I don't move all over the place. When I set this up for a cut I slide this piece of paper in under the step and then I lower my router a bit until that touches the paper and then I lock it in that position. The paper thickness is there to make sure that I don't route too deep and go into my base material. There are many more ways how to trim the edge bandings flush with the base material, but these are the three methods that I use frequently, so let's leave it there. The next step is to trim the edge bandings to correct length. The first step is to cut my edge bandings as close to the base as I can, without going into the base material. And then using a small block plane I trim the surfaces flush with each other. The short side edge bandings trim flush with the base material both in thickness and length. I will now make this cutout for the drain in the back side of my tabletop. Uh, it might have been smarter and saved me some work if I did this after I attached the long side edge bandings, but I did it before. So this is the time that I do it. I start by laying out my cut on my base material, then I drill two holes in the corner and remove most of the waste using a jigsaw. Since the top will be covered with laminate later on I don't need to spend time on any fancy router template here. Instead I take some pieces of scrap with straight edges and use those as a template and I screw them directly into the top and those holes will be covered later with laminate. Then I head over to the router table and I use a bearing guided trim bit to route my shape and I use these screwed on pieces as a template. Here I'm using these slightly thicker edge bandings that I mentioned in the beginning of this film. And I glue in the short side first. Before gluing the longer pieces I temporarily clamp one of them in position. And I take my circle template with intended diameter that later will be routed 19mm. And then I make a line on my longer edge banding. And then I remove most of the waste on the bandsaw and this is to simplify the routing later on. And then I glue my longer edge bandings in place. And just as before I use tape to hold it in position until I put the clamps on. Then I route these edge bandings almost flush with the base material. And I take the final pass using a hand plane. Again I use these temporary template pieces screwed to the top, but they are in a completely new position now. So this time the purpose of them is to template route the cutout in the edge banding itself. Back to the router table and pretty much the same setup as before. Now I route out this opening in the edge bandings. This template routing turned out quite okay. No tear out anywhere, no burn marks in the inner corners, and the rounds look really crisp and nice. Some might ask the question why this extra template routing step to create these inner rounds here. 
I could have just glued on three pieces of edge banding and leave it there. Well, the main reason is that later on I want the continuous profile to follow the entire outer contour of this part. And for that to work I need to have rounds on the outer corners, but I also need to have rounds on the inner corners. It's time to put the longer edge banding glued up in the clamps. And for longer pieces like this, where it could be hard to control the edge banding in the up and down direction, I usually use these kind of shims under my base surface and the shims are about as thick as I want the edge bandings to protrude. So these ones are around one millimeter thick. The big advantage with this shim is that it keeps a constant distance from the edge banding down to my base material. Especially if the edge banding is slightly warped then I mean the glue up can put the pressure on both parts while I tighten my clamps. For this longer glue up I'm also using clamping coils at both sides and that is to spread the clamping pressure and reduce the number of clamps needed. When the glue has dried I head over to the router table and trim my edge bandings flush with the base material. And then I trim the corners flush with the outer surfaces. I remove the protruding materials where my screws have been and after that this part is finished as far as I would come without the laminate. If you want to mess with this part this may be out of square and you need to tune something. This is the time to do it because everything will be much harder when the laminate is glued on. When I set my base dimensions for this part I mentioned I used two methods how to do this. This is what I would call the direct method. I used the correct outer dimensions from the beginning and take it from there. And that should hopefully make it quite easy to follow what I just did. But this method 1 requires some handwork to be done in the corners to trim the edge bandings to length and so on. So I would also like to quickly present my other method. We can call it method 2. It's not as direct as this one where we aim for correct dimensions from the beginning. But this method 2 is in my opinion a superior method in some ways. It doesn't require any hand to work and it's a quicker method, especially if you have many parts to make. I would also say that this method too is a bit safer since we have the possibility to trim the outer dimension at a very late stage after the edge bandings are glued on. This presentation on method 2 will be quite quick since it's 95% similar to method 1. To explain this method 2 I will only make a small test piece but the size is of no importance. Uh, here I jumped a few steps ahead so the short side edge bandings are already glued on and trimmed flush with my base material. In method 1 at this stage I trim my edge bandings flush with the outer surfaces of the base. Here I instead cut the edge banding short by a millimeter or so. And it doesn't matter if you cut into the base as well. You only need to do this operation on one of the sides. The other side you can leave the edge bandings sticking out. I know I said no hand tools for this method too and I just used one. But this is a very low level hand tool operation and the requirements on the accuracy is really low. Just cut it inside the base surface and you will be good enough. Now that I have one base surface here without protruding edge bandings. I will run that against my table saw fence and I will trim the opposite side. If you would just cut this part without any precautions, you would blow out the back surface of this edge padding here. So I clamped the support piece to my workpiece to prevent this from happening. So my first side is trimmed, and as you can see, the MDF rather than the edge padding took the blowout on the back side. Then I flipped my piece, so now I will run the newly cut surface against the fence. And I will trim this surface here where we manually cut the edge bandings short. We now have a part with perfectly trimmed edge bandings in all four corners without any hand planing involved. What you should note here is that this operation it consumes some of the base material in this direction here. Again I jumped a few steps here, so what I've done now is that I glued my edge banding on the long sides and I trimmed this flush with the base material. Here we have two options. If you are satisfied with your edge bandings and they are straight and nice then you can rip this to width directly. But sometimes in the glue up due to uneven pressure you get a small wave in the edge banding. You could also have uneven edge banding thickness from the planer 
and then we have the option to reoint one edge before ripping this to width. Just to show you the principle, I will reoint one edge and I will remove very little material from that edge. After jointing one edge, I run that against the fence and rip to correct width on my table saw. So no matter how inconsistent these edge bandings were coming from the planer or how bad we were at gluing them on, we now have two perfectly parallel sides and we have the correct width of our part. And then using my crosscut sled I did pretty much the same operation for the short sides. I began by trimming one side and then I flipped it over and in the same operation trimming the other side and cutting my part to correct length. So this part is complete. All the corners are square and it's cut to the correct dimensions. I will give you a few hints and tips how to think about the dimensions when you use this method too. If we start with this direction here I would make the base around 5mm oversized and that is to have some margin for these initial trims where we cut both long sides and we cut into the base as well. Then I would add maybe around 2mm on each edge banding thickness as well and that is to have some margin for this final trim that we did both in this direction and in this direction. This method too and having these extra margins to be able to trim the part at the late stage may have seemed complicated but it's really fast method and once you've done it a few times it's no problem to account for these trims. The remaining things to complete this part is to glue on the laminates around the corners and put the profile on the edges but this became a bit longer than I expected so we put that in a separate part, part 2b and I hopefully see you there.